Glad to see you're safe. Israel vowed to retaliate against Iran. I hope this doesn't devolve into a regional war and take nah. needed equipment well, away from Ukraine. Probably not. We'll probably get into that later, but I think that the Israelis will probably, if they do respond, it'll probably be on the downward trajectory, not on the upward trajectory of bombing some storehouse in Syria, maybe some Hezbollah command post, do something like they've done before in southern Lebanon, strike some other center. I, I don't think that they're going to dip their toes back into bombing more consulates. Um, I don't think they're going to make a habit of that or that they're going to find another way to escalate. But, I mean, I obviously I'm not in the mind of Netanyahu. My interest in what I would think would make sense from the Israeli perspective is different than what might necessarily be in the interest of Benjamin Netanyahu. A big problem with me trying to estimate, and this is going to be true about everybody online, and so here's my first piece of advice. Be skeptical of everybody online that's telling you this is what's going to happen. Um, but I can, like, suggest, like, this would make sense for Israel. to Like, for me, it makes sense. Israel just got away with blowing up the Iranian consulate. And then the Iranians responded by firing like 300 rockets and drones and ballistic missiles at them, and none of them hit their target. I think the the only person they ended up actually hurting was like some seven year old seven year old girl in another country. So you know it wasn't a massive success on the Iranian side. The Iranians seem to be indicating that, for their perspective, they're Gucci. They were like, "We did it. We we figured it out. We got them. We hit them back." Uh, we tried to generally attack Israel, even if the Jordanians and all these other people, the British pilots, the American pilots, and of course, the Israeli pilots already intercepted everything. We already did our strike. We've proven that we're willing to stand up to the great Satan or whatever. And so from the Israeli perspective, they basically got away with it. I mean, that's how I see it. They basically got away with it. The, the Iranians showed... They were able to show that they have deterrence. They are willing to show that they're really willing to attack Israel. There might be a negative side effect from the fact that everything was intercepted, so that might create more confidence on behalf of the Israelis about how they could deal with future Iranian attacks. But this is a good breaking off point. This is a good point for the Israelis to de-escalate a little bit, to just return to bombing storehouses in Syria and storehouses in southern Lebanon like they've been doing for the last decade. So... I think from, from my perspective, it would make sense for the Israelis to basically get out of it, get away with it. They probed, they found the Iranian limits to where they will bomb them. And that limit is bombing Iranian governmental buildings protected by diplomatic immunity like the consulate. It shouldn't have been attacked. That's my position. They got away with it, basically. So for me, it, may, it would make sense for them to de-escalate at this point. And I don't think the Israelis want to have to fight Hamas when they've still got, what, four to six good brigades. They've destroyed 18 of the 24. So they still got, like, potentially four to six brigades that got to fight. Then they got to deal with the issue of occupation. Then they have to deal with the issue of Lebanon and, I mean, not the issue of Lebanon, but the issue of Hezbollah and southern Lebanon, which have been firing rockets at them. And then they're going to have to deal with an onslaught of maybe more Iranian attacks, more Iranian investment in the resources in the region, while doing this all at the same time, while American support through all of this is starting to get a little shaky due to Israeli behavior, which if it continues, will only make that support more shaky. I, it, it makes more sense for them to be like, we've probed, we found their limits, let's move back. But that assumes that they're seeing it from this perspective and assumes that these are the only factors that they're considering what would be the best way for Israel to get away with the most possible while not entering war. Uh, to probe, to find out where the Iranians are, which is what I think it was. And, of course, to take out that high-level commander, which they took out. But if there's another interest at play, say, a political interest of Netanyahu, then I don't think this type of, like, purely, like, realist viewing of— it's not purely realist, but semi-realist like viewing of events is necessarily going to is gonna work here. Because this is the problem with realism, is these domestic factors— well, it's one of many problems with realism, but one of the problems with realism is a lot of it disregards these domestic factors. It's the same problem that came with John Mearsheimer's analysis of the Ukrainians and the Russians, and a lot of realist analysis of, of different conflicts. And so if the Israeli government has an incentive to keep the war going for political reasons and to just see if they can try to take out as many military assets as possible, hoping for some side of, sort of popularity rebound or hoping that the chaos of the war will keep the Israeli public subdued enough to not call for elections until the fighting is over, that they can keep this weird type of unity government together enough to extend this to month after month after month after month, um, then the calculus changes. 
And now we're in a situation or territory that's a little bit uncharted and is going to be much more difficult for me to measure because then I'm measuring Israel's strategic interests and their state interests against Netanyahu's personal interests and his political interests. And I can't really show you where that clear dividing line is. And so for anybody telling you that they know what's going to happen next, one was second, what was that thing I saw? What was that thing I saw that, that, that gave me a giggle? What was that thumbnail? Oh yeah. If anybody is showing you like thumbnails like this saying, <laughs> and I really, and I'm going to be honest with you. I really hate thumbnails like this. I really don't like this stuff. This type of stuff gets under my skin. If you see thumbnails like this, right? Treat it as fear mongering. That's what it is. It's fear mongering. Okay, just because we're in territory that's a little unprecedented or we're breaking diplomatic norms through the blowing up of a consulate, which I'm not a fan of, by the way, that doesn't mean World War III is around the corner. And because we don't know where the personal political interest meets the state interest, it's very difficult for anybody to predict something like, say, World War III, or say, oh, this is going to escalate further because then the Iranians are going to try again so they can actually destroy Israeli military assets. Or, oh, now that the Israelis said they're going to respond, they're going to blow up another consulate. And then the Iranians will be forced to do an even bigger attack to establish deterrence. And as the attacks get bigger, wars become more likely. You can't determine this due to the issue I brought earlier of trying to distinguish the state interest versus the personal interest. And you can't do it because... I'm going to be blunt. A lot of these commentators, I don't think, know much about the state interests or know much about the capabilities of the Israelis or the Iranians or, hey, what could the Iranians do with ballistic missiles? They got 99 percent of them intercepted this time. Like, could, do they believe that if they what if they were to do some bigger attack and then it had the same interception rate? Would that help Iranian deterrence or would that hurt Iranian deterrence? These are questions I don't have an answer to. A lot of people don't have answers to. And certainly commentators on Twitch and YouTube from the alternative space without experience in the region, without professional experience, military experience, of reporting experience in these areas, don't listen to them if they're telling you World War III is about the corner, World War III is likely, et cetera, et cetera. Don't listen to it. It's nonsense. So I think if you were to ask me, given all of the asterisks that I just gave about how it's difficult for me to judge the situation, this seems like the perfect place for the Israelis to stop. They, they could see this as we probed and probed and probed. We struck those places in Southern Lebanon. We killed those people in Southern Lebanon in those high profile meetings. We had, uh, and the Iranians stayed back. We kept going, we kept pushing, we kept pushing. We blew up a consulate, broke, broke this diplomatic norm. We broke it right over our knee, killed this high ranking official, and then the Iranians punched back. It didn't kill anyone. They can get out of it generally scot-free while having probed up to what they would say is the limit that Iran will allow it without doing direct strikes on Israel. So for me, it would make sense for the Israeli perspective if the goal is to avoid war while destroying as much Iranian military capacity in Syria and so the Lebanon and Gaza, which I generally think is what the Israelis are trying to do, it would make sense for them to stop at this area of probing. Now, they did say they're going to respond, like I said earlier, and they probably will. But that response, considering that the only person that was injured in this Iranian attack was a seven-year-old uh, 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 seven girl, uh, it allows them a lot more flexibility in their response because there's not going to probably be a big there's not going to be a big call in Israeli society kill Iran invade Iran war with Iran because they generally got off away with this scot free even though they broke the diplomatic norm and so I think if the goal is to degrade Iranian military capacity while avoiding war both because the United States doesn't want to get involved in that the Israeli government I mean should. If they're thinking rationally, like we've already discussed, doesn't want to have to deal with a war on multiple fronts right now, um, unless we're talking about, again, personal political interests, it would make sense for them to be like, OK, this is our limit. Let's stay under this limit and let's see what we can do within the constraint, uh, the constraints that the Iranians have just outlined for us. Let's strike some more Hezbollah places in southern Lebanon. Let's strike some more locations in Syria that will probably stay where, stay where it is with the only real exception to what has been the case for the last 12, 14 years, ever since the Syrian civil war started, is going to be the strikes in Southern Lebanon. That's at least how I see the likely scenario. Of course, 
I am saying this off of, I'm type of taking the opinions of others, measuring them, putting them in myself, listening to their analysis. I'm taking my own judgment here as somebody who is not an expert in this specific region, certainly. I wouldn't even say I'm a necessarily a Ukraine expert. I would say I know a lot more about it, considering I've been covering this war going on three years now on the ground, but that would be my estimation. But yes, don't listen to this. I don't know what, I don't even know what the purpose of that type of fear mongering really is outside of like, I, re I really don't know. I like viewership is the main thing I'm thinking of. Uh, and I don't want to say that it was viewership because that would imply like choosing to go with head, gra head grabby headlines over informing your audience. But I don't see what else could be the purpose of saying that headline. It's Israel's fault they attacked the embassy in Iran has a right to respond. Israel started it, not Iran. Okay, well, number one, I don't really care about who started it, right? Like, this, they're like their children on the playground. Israel hit me first! I'm not doing... No, okay? Uh, it's less about who started, like, the whole... Because if we go... We're going to have to go back a while if we're talking about who started the conflict between the revolutionary government in Tehran and Tel Aviv. Uh, but... My standard has been clear, and I've said this since the beginning. Striking the consulate put the Iranians in a position where they had no choice, no choice, but to respond with force. I didn't know how they were going to respond. I said, maybe they're not going to do a direct attack on Israel. Maybe they'll attack an Israeli consulate. And then Israel will be in the difficult position of having one of their consulates attacked after blowing up an Iranian consulate. And are they going to blow up another Iranian consulate? Um, but... Instead, they chose to do a direct strike on Iran. It didn't kill anybody. It injured a seven-year-old girl. Uh, Israel intercepted 99% of it. It wasn't just Israel. It was Jordan. It was the UK. It was the United States. It was a bunch of countries in the region that worked with the Israelis to intercept this, which caused a lot of outrage online because they were surprised to see that a lot of these governments were willing to work with Israel against the Iranians. But that's because many of them probably don't know the history of the conflict between a lot of the Gulf Arab states and the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard, the Iranian government, and how they've been fighting against each other. They were fighting against each other in Syria. They were fighting against each other in Yemen. They were fighting against each other in places all across uh, the Middle East. So it shouldn't be that surprising. I will say that it definitely is, when it comes to the public perspective, unpopular for them to be working with the Israeli government right now. But their strategic calculus has been less focused on the Palestinians now for decades and decades. And so it doesn't surprise me particularly that much. Dovebin Alvalis, thank you so much for the tier one. I've been stuff for 19 months. Thank you for your work. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. But yes, they shouldn't have, in my purview, because I, I like the diplomatic standard of don't strike consulates, right? Don't strike consulates. That's something that I like to hold as diplomatic standard. But at the end of the day, they struck the consulate, they justified it by saying that people in the consulate were some of those who organized the attacks. Um, I mean, whether or not we know that for sure, I have no idea. The Saudis are seeming to give that more airtime than, uh, uh, than they were giving it before. I saw some certain statements from Saudi officials that seemed to suggest that they believe Iran might have been involved in the organizing of October 7th in some capacity, but I have yet to see any hard evidence. So I'm not gonna believe Saudi press secretaries about the Iranian government or the Israeli government statements about it until I see more hard evidence. Right now it's, it stays in the realm of allegations. Either way, the Iranian government from the perspective of, of just the geopolitics and making and like keeping deterrence, they had to respond. Because if they had the Israelis blow up their consulate, which they thought was safe because it would normally fall under diplomatic immunity and it was still falling under, even if there's criminals in it, even if there's horrid genocidal warmongers in it, Interna by international law and by those standards, it should have still been protected by immunity. And so they had to find some way to respond that would stop the Israelis from doing this again or from the Israelis thinking that they could do this with impunity. That if they blow up Iranian consulates, the Iranians can't do that. I mean, what would have been the message of the Iranians had the consulate blown up and they just stood there and they were like, don't do that again, please. That sucked. That was a real mean move. Well, then the Israeli government and Yahoo's government would take advantage. It'd be like, oh my God, we just blew up a consulate. You didn't do anything. We can get away. With Maybe we can do direct strikes on Iran, for God's sake. If we can get away with a strike on a consulate and there's no response, maybe they think a direct strike on Iran would facilitate, uh, like Iran as in the physical entity of Iran, even though technically a consulate 
is under international law part of Iranian territory, maybe on the geographic body of Iran, we get away with that. And then it escalates further. Or they feel like they could strike more consulates. They feel like they can do this activity with impunity. Then Iranian deterrence would have been broken down. And so for the Iranians, it was as much of like probably political and ideological, uh, but largely it'd probably be uh, positioning and uh, and basically speaking with violence. And I hate, and that's a weird way to put it, but the statement the Iranians wanted to say was, do that again, expect more. And they didn't want this message to be sent being through an action, do that again, eh. And so, yeah, I believe the Iranians were put in a position where they had to do something, and this is the something they did, and thankfully nobody died. That's not to say I'm happy the Iranians bombed Israel. I'm just saying, from their perspective, that's how they're viewing this. And that's the logic they're thinking about this under. Uh, that's kind of what upsets me about how the, uh, this, the way the U.S. and Western state officials have responded and framed this. It feels like they are trying to set the standard that bombing consulates and embassies are fair game. What's interesting is if you ask American officials, in, in reference to this, it, they'll be like, hey, what do you think of this? And they'll avoid the question. And then you'll ask, if... You bomb, if somebody bombs your consulate, what will happen? Oh, we'll respond with force. Every single government in the world, if they had the ability to do a, a physical response to deter their enemies, would do what the Iranians would do here. Immediately when the attack happened, the first thing that hit my mind was, oh God, what are the Iranians gonna do? Because I knew they, they were gonna have to do something from their perspective, they have to just like any other country would have to from their perspective. In fact, can we bring up the David Cameron response? I think we have the David Cameron response. This response was probably the most obviously dodgy. Uh, we, I have this on AO6 because I wanted to talk about his response to the idea of shooting down Russian strikes in Ukraine. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit, but can, let's bring it back to where he's talking about the strike itself. I don't know where it starts. So we'll start from the beginning, but you can see he's asked by the interviewer here. And mind you, the interviewer asking him questions is a conservative interviewer. This is a very conservative interviewer. This is not, as, as if I remember correctly, wait, let me make sure that I'm not talking out my butt right now about who the interviewer is. Yeah, I believe so. I believe so, if I remember correctly. So this is not somebody who's like some lefty, like, this is a conservative interviewer pressuring him on, well, I mean, do we endorse these types of attacks? and he just keeps dodging the question. And he even says, I'm not gonna answer it. Let's see if we can find where this is. No, at first we were actually right about the bravery of- Ah, God, I had to sp sped up. This is how I watch all videos off stream. It's like, well, not all videos, but videos like this at two speed to get through it pilots. Quickly. We were effectively backfilling for the Americans in the operation we've been doing for many years now to suppress Daesh ISIL in Iraq and Syria. So we provided more planes for that. Okay, let's so let's pause. Expected that the unexpected deal while it's hardly unexpected that the UK and the US were there to help with Israel, how significant is it that Jordan also put up jets and intelligence I understand? Okay, well, this is not the question I want to hear. I want to hear, is this it? Where are you on the Iranian view that this... Here we go. Where are you on the Iranian view that this was only as a result of the bombing of the embassy in Damascus? Is that something that you've called out, Lord? By the way, the Iranian view. This is 100% why it happened. The Iranians did not bomb Israel because they bombed Gaza. If that was the case, if this had anything to do with Gaza, they would have bombed Israel before when the major civilian casualties were coming out of Gaza. There's still major civilian casualties coming out of Gaza, but the, when the numbers were much larger at the start of the operation, it, there would have been a million other points for the Iranians to have responded to the Israelis because of the Operation Gaza. It was only after the blowing up of the, of the consulate that they decided that they would go for a direct strike on uh, Israel from Iran. So when we say that's the Iranian view, that's the view, that's why they did it. That's when we take the Iranian, that is why they did it. I just want to be clear, this isn't the perspective of like state media, that is why the Iranian government did it. And it's no surprise that after we killed Soleimani, the Iranians struck an American base. Why did they do that? Because we killed Soleimani. They wanted to establish some form of deterrence so that we wouldn't go around the Middle East assassinating all their high profile generals and undermining uh, their funding of different militias that have bought and butchered people in Syria and other countries in the region. Cameron. 
Well, look, I think if you look at the scale of what Iran was trying to do, you know, 110 ballistic missiles, 36 cruise missiles, 185 drones, it's sometimes portrayed... 300, 300 objects in total. I think a little bit over 300, actually. Trade this attack as a sort of drone sworn swarm, but actually, you know, the use of ballistic missiles in a state-on-state -state attack is a very significant move by Iran. Very dangerous, very reckless. Fortunately, it was an almost total uh, failure. But I don't think it was justified in any way by reference to what happened in um, Damascus. Um, but look, I think now. The most important thing, the Israeli war cabinet. Here, here will be my question to any Western diplomat on this. What would you have done? It, if someone attacked and bombed your consulate and killed, let's say it was the director of the CIA or some high profile CIA official or MI6, since we're talking about the British, which is their version of the CIA, but just more cringe, um, what would you do? Is there any way for you to respond to that without violence? Is how do you respond to that in a way that maintains deterrence, discourages people from doing it again, and is satisfactory to your civilian population? Which, by the way, if you look at the memes on Iranian Twitter, they're not happy with the strike because it didn't do anything. They everything was intercepted. It, wow, you injured a seven-year-old girl. Israel has fallen. Tel Aviv is in the hands of the of Hamas. It, it didn't do anything. I, I remember I saw this one meme, and it was. I, I can't I, I can't believe I'm describing this in audio form. It's actually more beautiful that I describe it this way than I just show it, so I make it more awkward. It was a bunch of little people throwing javelins in what I assume was some version of like the Special Olympics or Olympics for little people. I don't know. They were showing javelins, and it was like Hamas, uh, uh, Iran, and it was all these different people like throwing stuff at Israel. And then it was a like big Israel having toothpicks, like a big guy just having toothpicks thrown on their shirt. And that was like going viral on Iranian Twitter. They are not happy with the response in of itself because they thought it was too, uh, I don't know what word to use besides pansy. It was it was soft. It was, uh, there was no f firmness in the wrists. I don't know what else to say here. So, I mean, what would you do? That would be my question. What would you do if your consulate was attacked? Would there be a nonviolent response? What could the Iranians or should have the Iranians have done? That's, and that's a follow-up question. What would you have done in the situation, and what should the Iranians have done? Yes. Um, but look, I think now the most important thing, the Israeli war cabinet has been meeting. They have every right to respond, and you'd understand that as an Israeli citizen, you'd be thinking, my country came under attack, we must respond. We're asking them as their friends to think with, with head as well as heart, to be smart as well as tough, to recognize Iran has failed, and the best way to de-escalate the situation is not to attack back, but instead to focus on Hamas's failure to release the hostages and the failure to agree to a, a pause in the fighting in Gaza because we badly need to get aid in there and get the hostages home. I, I will come back one last time to that question, though. <clears throat> if, if Israel was responsible for the bombing in Damascus, are you critical of that? OK, that's a reframing of the question, but it is hammering the same point. I think maybe some follow up questions would have been better. Like, if you won't answer this question, which, spoiler alert, he keeps avoiding it, then you got to follow it up with other questions. OK, then what would you do if America, if the British consulate in Jordan was blown up and it killed an MI6 official, what would you do? Well, it's a matter for Israel. We haven't made a comment on it. The only thing I'd say but is... Why, why not comment, Lord well, Cameron? Well, I'll, I'll, tell you what, I'll tell you why. Because if you look at what the Iranian revolution Revolutionary Guard has done. They are the people that have been backing Hamas, who carried out the horrific October 7th attack. They are the people who've been backing the Houthis, bombing ships in the Red Sea, irrespective of what country they come from. They are the people that back Hezbollah, launching missiles into Israel. Okay, he's, he's saying a bunch of stuff out, he's throwing a bunch of stuff out there. And look, the guy who was killed, probably awful. If you see the different groups that the ROGC backs throughout the Middle East, like Hezbollah, which butchered Assyrians in Syria, worked with the Assad regime to butcher his own people. If you look at the type of behavior that other militias, it's not nice, it's not lovely, really bad behavior. But we all benefit, every state, including the United Kingdom, from the diplomatic standard of consulates and our buildings overseas being off limits. If that is degraded by the Israelis, if that is degraded by anyone, quite frankly, that doesn't just affect them, it affects us. If 
the view is, oh, consulates are on the table as military targets, then what about our intelligence assets that moves from different consulate buildings? Let's not pretend that we don't use the consulate buildings to move, uh, you know, intelligence assets or different things that are of use to us. Or we don't take high profile officials, put them in there under the assumption that they'd be safe in these buildings. And so it feels like instead of dealing with a conundrum where he knows that the United Kingdom benefits from this, but also the Israelis really hate and the British and the Americans really hate the IRGC, uh, because of this, they just decided to take the no opinion option. I don't know if you ever do like the those like political compass tests. They've got strongly agree, strongly disagree, no opinion. He just keeps spam in the middle. No opinion, no opinion, no opinion. Israel and causing, you know, remember, there are about 100,000 people in the north of Israel who can't go to their homes because of Hezbollah. So can I understand Israel's frustration with the IRGC? Yes, I absolutely can. Do I think Iran's response with this state-on-state -state attack was justified? No, it wasn't. Unfortunately, it was an almost total failure. But it wasn't justified to bomb an embassy in Damascus, was it? Uh, as I say, I'm not getting into what right. Israel has or hasn't done. Can we talk about what has or hasn't done? What does that even? So you want to have a conversation about British planes intercepting Iranian missiles striking Israel, but avoid the incident that incited said strikes and could, if repeated in the future, incite more strikes then involving British airmen and more interceptions. No comment whatsoever. No comment. I mean, the follow-up question would be, I already told the two follow-up questions, but another follow-up question would be, why do you think you can't answer that? Why do you think it's fair that you don't have to answer that question if British airmen will be risking their lives to some degree to intercept these missiles? I mean, it's not a, it's not like they're all going to die or something, but I mean, anytime you take one of these planes and you fly out, especially if you're engaging in intercepting, you're flying close to these things, it's going to come with risk if you start to involve these planes in direct military operations.